Uh, I live in Brooklyn. But it doesn't make you sick. Oh. a pared down version. Bar, to the bar. There we go. We're ready. Hello, everybody. Thank you for coming to Abel's booth today for creating branded content. I'm David Robin. I'm the business development manager here at Abel's Cine. And we have some uh, really great guests today on our panel. Uh, to my right is Bethany Schwartz. Bethany is the vice president and executive producer at Townhouse New York. After launching her career at Weinstein, Weinstein's company, she carried her passion for production to Gray Advertising, leading her to develop the in-house production company within Vision at Gray in 2011. Bethany is currently managing video production at WPP's new production agency, Townhouse Worldwide, where she oversees a wide range of video projects from broadcast to documentaries and digital media content. As the landscape of entertainment, media, and technology evolves, she is inspired to find creative, nimble solutions for her clients and agency partners while producing effective and engaging work. Chris Paolo is the executive director of Video for Time, Inc. Did I get that correct? That is correct. Yeah. Where he has been instrumental in the expansion of content offerings and production operations for People, Time, Sports Illustrated, Essence, Fortune, and other Time, Inc. properties. 
With experience in broadcast, web, advertising, social media, and short and long form narrative, Chris has also produced and directed content for clients including Aflac and General Mills, designed and executed mobile video course delivery, and managed major studio and post-production upgrades for Time Inc., the Wealth Channel, and the American College. Chris has taught courses and guest lectured for the Cinema and Television Department at Drexel University, the Academy of Art University San Francisco, and LeBeau College of Business. Dan Meyer is Production Technical Manager for Vice Media. Dan has been managing equipment for Vice for close to a decade as the company has transformed the traditional media publisher to dynamic digital agency. Dan's team supports up to 20 teams that produce video and editorial content for marketers. With Vice's fleet of close to 200 cameras, Dan manages in-house production ranging from seasonal episodic television for Viceland to nightly and weekly news shows on HBO. With the fleet of cameras Dan manage, manages, equipment operations for Vice, many vertical channels, as well as mobile content and branded and white label sponsored content. Big hand for our panel. So this panel um, originated around creating branded content. Now branded content um, is now so diverse, it's everything that isn't a television commercial, as it turns out. Um, so we're going, to, we're going to try to avoid hard definitions of branded content. Rather, today, what I'd like to do is focus on how each person in their work focuses their energies on branded content and how they define it and use it. Um, so I'm going to go out on a limb here, because basically all of this is around creativity. And I'm going to go out on a limb and, and make the statement, creativity dri derives from optimism. I come from the ad world as a still photographer and producer. In that role, optimism was what got me up every morning with the hope that today I might create something that inspires, moves, and motivates people. Working with our team at Able City, we do the same thing with technology. We're at the nexus of both creativity and technology, and we strive to create um, and educate our clients uh, to be able to use the tools to motivate, evoke, and tell stories. So each of our accomplished panelists are also very deeply connected to the optimism of creativity in their own way, and each of their unique worlds, they continue to make a distinct mark by creating evocative stories. I'm gonna start with a brief history, I dare say drunk history, of the origins of branded content. In 1930 was the first time we saw branded content. It was a, tele a radio show, excuse me, not television, called Camel News Caravan, and it was, it was loosely a branded content production because it started out and throughout the program you were reminded that it was sponsored by Camel, but that was it. There was no advertising hard sales around Camel cigarettes. Then in 1963 through 1988 there was Mutual of Omaha's Wild Kingdom. Um, I, of course, wasn't born yet. Um, groundbreaking, this is a groundbreaking episodic uh, nature series before there was Nature Channel. And again, it was very similar to the Camel News Caravan in which they only talked about uh, Mutual Omaha in the beginning and at the end, and it was in their title. So it was very, 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 very loosely affiliated with the brand, but you got the message. Then in 1999, everything changed with the in introduction of the programmable VCR, excuse me, DVR. This is the first time audiences could cut the cord and completely alleviate commercials. So then the challenge came for brands and advertising agency and advertisers to figure out how are we gonna reach our audiences. In 2001, the first modern use term, branded content, took hold with BMW's high production value episodic series called The Higher. I don't know if anybody remembers that. It was, um, it was directed by Guy Ritchie and starred Clive Owen, because BMW doesn't have any money. And it was distributed on the web on, and CDs and meant to entertain and educate. You saw the car, but there was no advertising around it. And it built a story around this secret agent who was James Bondish. That was the first time we actually saw it as a, a branded content with brand placement in the content. Jump to 2013 and branded content has become so important that the age old arbiter of what is noteworthy in advertising the Cannes Lion Awards, recognized the genre with the Grand Prix Award in the branded content entertainment category. For those interested, um, the Ant Rally World Wildlife Fund was the winner, and that's a great spot, by the way, and that was the one that won the first year in 2013. So now we fast forward into where we are now, and branded content is everywhere. 
everywhere on your iPhone, everywhere on your iPad, everywhere you look is branded content. Anything that's outside of the television commercial, because people now don't really watch television commercials. So we have to find ways of reaching audiences and, and using, using other means to promote something that isn't necessarily a hard sell. So in my conversation with the AICP board um, in New York, we were discussing this topic, and it, and it became very clear that there is no singular empirical definition of branded content. So it would be futile, like I said, to attempt to do so here. Um, so today we're just going to explore, in a very broad sense, the ability of imagery, specifically moving imagery, to connect people with big brands and big ideas through emotion and inspiration. Side note here, um, while what we create might be awkwardly termed content, what we strive to deliver is inspiration and human connection. So what I'd like to do is invite everyone in the audience to jump in. This is a conversation with us, but it's also a conversation with you guys out there. If there's any questions you have, please raise your hand and let us know because I have my list of questions. Um, and we'll move through those, but that might, might spur some other questions. And I'd rather you not wait till the end, because you might forget, if you're like me, you'll forget the question. So let's start out. I'm going to start out with a question for all, because I already went through that whole beat that one to death, um, that we're not going to define branded content. But for each of you, I'd like you each to talk about how you relate to branded content, since it is such a big bucket. Um, and from your perspective, how do you work with it, and how do you think of it? So, Bethany, would you like to start? Uh, as a producer, I think my focus is the mechanics and logistics of storytelling through branded content. Um, you know, it's a unique piece of creative that articulates a brand's values but doesn't really need to have the brand voice. I think one way we're leveraging this is through influencers. You know, in particular for production where we used to cast actors, now we're relying on influencers that have the built-in audience. Um, you know, and I think con and consumers are more likely to take a recommendation from an influencer who they have a connection with emotionally than a, r a random actor that has been hired by a corporate company to deliver a message. So I'm going to circle back with you about how you find your influencers, unless that's a company secret. <laughs> Chris? Um, so at Time Inc., it's um, a little strange because we have so many brands. So um, even though we have a branded group uh, called The Foundry, um, the type of content really depends on the brand. So people is not like time, right? And it's not like SI, it's not like these other ones. So um, it really makes, it's really important to find the stories that connect with those particular brands and that audience, right? So um, we're not gonna do certain things in certain productions because it just doesn't make sense to do it that way. Um, so really that's where it starts, is it starts at identifying where it might fit, right? Um, and in a lot of cases, it goes both ways. It'll go from the advertiser wanting, knowing what they want to doing the opposite, where we've worked with an advertiser for a long time and then say, you know what would be really cool? We can go this way with this story. But ultimately, the advertiser is looking at us because we, have, we know our audience. We've been successful with them, so that's why they want to partner with us. So, um, and then from there, then you go to the second phase, which is production and everything else. So, so, so the, uh, the, the individual brands, you have a set form in the way you get to the root of what they're what they're trying to convey, or because the brand message in in and we'll get to this. The brand message in in branded content is different than brand than advertising. Exactly. So, so do they have usually a sense of what they want to see, or do you really help them with that for the most part? Well, they're coming because they they kind of know what they want, right? Right, but they don't really know what they want, and that's where in reality, if if we didn't know our own audience and our brand, they wouldn't be coming to us. Right. So, and that goes a certain, obviously certain agencies are different than other ones. Uh, you know, some are more aggressive and other ones are back off, you know. Um, and other ones are like, no, like I trust you, we have a relationship for many years and, you know, what's coming down the pipeline and what fits with that pipeline, right? Right, so, so and they were advertisers previously with yes. with one of your products. Exactly. Right? So, so you already have a... a yeah, we already have a many, right. many year rapport with... It's so content. rare. It's a unique position. Yeah, it's a good position to be in. Yeah, great. Dan? I, I could mirror a lot of what you're saying. Um, I think that we do a similar thing where half the time a brand will come to us with a with like a vision or an idea for the actual content. But what we really prefer is sort of the camel 
thing that you were talking about, which we call sponsored content. And that's our, our favorite thing to do is when a brand comes to us and we have a menu, like a, basically a pitch deck of documentaries that are ready to make that just need funding. Right. And it's like a really cut and dry relationship where we say, all right, Toyota, here's this thing we're going to make anyways. It's in the contract that you have no editorial notes whatsoever. You're just getting pre-roll and you're getting to put it out in your channels as well. And we make our content the way we're going to make it anyways. And a lot of brands come to us for that reason. And that's our favorite thing. But we do, the other thing we like to do is to do bigger projects where a brand comes to us and says, let's just go, let's just think here. And we find a middle ground of something we want to do that they want to do and we create something new together which also can work, but we usually like that to be a bigger thing than our Interesting. smaller I, pieces. I have a follow-up, and maybe it's for, for, for both Chris and Dan. Um, advice, particularly, your, your news, or I, I don't know if you're news, I, I don't know how you well, News and entertainment. That, yeah. So how do you balance um, editorial integrity with the dissemination of sponsor branded content? Are they completely separate? Do you keep those two divisions completely yeah, separate? Yeah, I mean, that's why I think our, our capital N news is mm -hmm. with HBO which has no advertisers. Right. And so that'd be Vice News Tonight, which is our nightly show, and then Vice on HBO, which mm -hmm. is our weekly. That's the stuff we consider our actual, you know, pure journalistic work. Got it. And there's no branding on Got that it. whatsoever. Got it. So Cause we, And I mean, even like, this is a good example, um, since we're here at Able, Sony, when we purchased a lot of cameras to for Vice News Tonight, Sony was like, oh, should we do some kind of thing with you guys? to like say, oh, you got these cameras, we'll give you a deal, whatever. And the executive producer said no, because we might have to cover Sony at some point. Interesting. It was like, you know, if like think about it at Foxconn with Apple and right. things that happen, like we might have to report on Sony's if it's news. So we keep it very clean in that Interesting. realm. So Chris, do you? Do it's you, similar, yeah. Sim it, so the, the, the news brands, the, you know, Time, Fortune, mm -hmm. those ones um, that are really clear news, like, they would, they could perhaps right. report on anything. Where we shy, we don't shy away. I wouldn't say that. We do some branded content for time, um, but ultimately it's a lot easier to sell pre-roll and things like that against mm -hmm. that. Right. Um, if you do things like Sports Illustrated and People are a little different. They're still very journalistic, obviously. Um, but then we have shows where they will sponsor segments of shows. Uh, SI Now is an example where. Um, Toyota sponsors that, so their logo's in the background, right? Um, but at the same time, we're not going to necessarily do the show in the back of a truck, right? Right, And that's no slight against Toyota trucks, it's just right. ultimately there's still journalism going on, we're not, you know, we're not right. going to do that. Um, the lifestyle brands are the, I, I don't want to say easiest ones to do, but ultimately lifestyle is, if we're going to do turkey recipes for the holidays, this is the easiest one, we do it every year, we're going to do that anyway. Right. So if we're going to do it anyway, there is no journalistic integrity right. there that we're going to break if we then, right. you know, go to Purdue and talk to them right. or whoever that is. So right. um, the lifestyle ones are the really the the, the lowest hanging fruit that you can just go. So there is a conscious uh, discussion with oh, both absolutely. of your yeah. venues. Yeah, a conscious absolutely. discussion and uh, I guess ground rules for where that line is very specifically. Oh yeah. Yeah. So Bethany, I was going to circle back with you about influencers and how. How does your agency or town townhouse go about finding influencers? What what I is mean, it? the process is very much like casting regular actors. Yeah, influencers have their own agents, just like actors do. So you would go to an agency, uh, depending on what the brand was, and find your influencer that way. Uh, you know, we just did a big campaign with Stouffer's, and we used influencers that had a built-in audience that would tap into those consumers that were looking to cook, and you know. Maybe those mothers, and you know, that, that's how you find the influencers. So, influ uh, bear with my ignorance here. So, influencers, as in, have 11 million followers on. Yeah, I mean, they're, right. they have a huge social following, and people have been following them. It's an organic thing for, and you know, co consumers have connections with them, so it, it feels right for the brand to utilize that and leverage that capability. Right. Okay, cool. Next question for you again. Um, since you didn't want to talk, <laughs> um, we'll get it all out up front. Um, how do you think the intended deliverable or platform affects the style, length, and creative approach for the content? Uh, 
I, I think from a production standpoint, what we're seeing is that we're not relying on sound as much. Uh, you know, with digital platforms like Attention and most of those platforms, they don't rely on sound at all. You're, 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 it's all visual. Everyone's going through through so quickly, so you need to have a visual message, and also people are reading the text. So we can't rely on the audio of that. That's something that we're seeing a lot on a, from a production standpoint. We're always shooting audio, but even last week we did a Facebook Live thing and we were tracking the data, and over 90% of the viewers watching it was without sound. Interesting. Yeah. Interesting. So I might ask that question of Chris as well. Um, yeah. I mean, we do, for anything that's social, exact right. same thing. No sound. Right? Not that it's no sound, it's just we need, you need to understand understand that the audience will consume it in various ways, right? Mm -hmm. So um, our biggest focus is concentrate on the primary delivery platform. So if the primary delivery platform is OTT, then it's going to be shot like it's a lean back experience, right? And then if I'm going to cut clips and it goes out via social, it may not be exactly right for social, but at the same time, I'm still going to, we're still going to put it out there. Mm -hmm. um, but really, it's the primary focus of wherever the delivery platform is. We will shoot for that all the time. And so the other question would be, we're seeing um, specifically, there's, there's a few that come to mind, um, Jack in the Box and Burger King, where there's their, their branded content, social branded content, and their branded content, separate from their commercials, were so di diverged so far from the original branded messaging on their commercials. The question is, you know, in the past, Brands um, obviously had brand stewards that very carefully controlled the messaging as it went out, and everything sort of had to match and march in, in, in unison. Um, do you have more license? Do you find, uh, and this goes for all of you, do you, do you find that there's more license with branded content where you can sort of diverge and have a little more reverence uh, in your messaging? Uh, think about the the... the the ones that come to mind are, like I said, the Jack in the Box one with sort of this weird couple that was, uh, you know, I, I won't go into it because we have a mixed audience, but it was very off color. And the, the King, the Burger King King, kind of creepy character, not really, uh, not really something a brand would like to have displayed, but it was, in their social, it had a you know, great impact. Do you, do you see that in your travels, the, the, that you can, be a, you can have a little more leeway with the brand in, in other venues besides typical broadcast commercials? Uh, no? Well, I mean, when the con when, it, when I'm producing the content, the creative has already been defined. Right. So um, when it comes to me, I'm just doing logistics and operations. Certainly, that we play with it a bit, um, and it definitely is not as stringent as, say, a typical broadcast commercial. Uh, I think it's usually more fun and more human. You're trying to connect with the audience on a more human level. But, yeah, I mean... I'm not sure I'm the best person to answer. No, no, it was more. It was more about what crosses your desk and yeah. your capacity. So, do you when you and I think you answered the question. When it crosses your desk from creative, um, they tend to push the envelope. Yeah, a I think bit there's more. looser boundaries. Am I leading the witness? I'm sorry. Are you leading? <laughs> there's looser boundaries certainly when it comes to social. I think social, yeah, but yeah, I, I think ultimately it's should it it's really an extension of whatever story is right. wanting to be told anyway. So if it's a story for Fortune, and they wanted to cover whatever business story right. they wanted to cover, and it wasn't necessarily on the, let's call it the journalistic palette for that quarter or whatever it is, right. but then a brand wants to do it, it's really just an extension. I would say it's not it's not the same type of leeway where all of a sudden Fortune's going to reinvent their brand, you know? Or, right. Yeah, yeah I, we're still in the relatively strict Right. No. Ones. No. And not yeah. the, the big brands are not taking those kinds of chances well, unless they're. No. Well, yeah. I mean, what, what I would think about on our side is that we're not thinking about reinventing people because right. people is doing just fine. Right. right. But what we're doing is then saying if there's an opening for something like um, a new brand that has an audience pool where we can actually have our voice that is not exactly what's there. Mm -hmm. So, for example. Um, well done is a good example. We launched that a month ago, so it's it's basically tasty. Right. You know, it's the same. Right. I shouldn't say it that way, but it's basically the same thing, right? Um, but we have cooking light, real simple, food and wine, where the content, certain sponsorships wouldn't go towards either, any of those three. But now, this is very social, social first, and we can leverage those resources and then make branded content for 
audiences right. that we want. So Got really, it. we're creating completely new titles if we can. Got it. Any questions so far? No? OK. I, I have something to add to that go, topic. Go. So we actually created um, almost what you would call an entire new department to do that kind of work that you're talking about. Oh, cool. When we launched Viceland, which is our TV channel that we launched last February, we wanted the ads to not feel so much like ads. And so we created a whole team called the Vice Lab, which is a group of people right now. It's about 20 people, producers and shooters, that work in the office every day. And they have access to equipment pretty much 24 seven. And we work with brands to make, I guess, what you would call like native advertising. Right. So that when it's on the actual television channel, between breaks, it kind of feels like you're never really going to a, a break sometimes. And we're actually working with brands like MailChimp and Geico and like, I can't even remember, like a handful of smaller brands to bigger brands. Samsung is one of the big ones where they come to us for that very reason, to do something outside of their major mm -hmm. agenda, to do things that are weird, and they know it's gonna be weird going into it. And they're kind of like, let's see what you can come up with. And because it's a lab, it's known that it's experimental and things are allowed to fail. Like we let people go down dark alleys to see if they find something. And if they don't, there's no like punishment because they might make a video that's too weird, right. but at least we tried. And so we've created this new section just for that very thing to see what happens and what works and what doesn't. And brands have been happy with it. And the more experiments that come out good, the more we kind of get to do. That's because really neat. People That's see really it. neat. But um, other people are doing MTV's doing a lab, and a lot of people are using this lab concept. I think it goes back to like Bell Labs, and like just this idea of giving a budget and just letting people roll with stuff and see what happens. You mentioned native. Um, I think it might be helpful if we can, again, I was going to shy away from definitions, but I think it's important for those of you who don't necessarily know um, the difference between native yeah. content and branded content. Uh, it's really hard. Wh whoever wants to take a stab at it. But you, in, in your world, you, <laughs> yeah. just, you just said you think it's what you're creating it, is more native. It's a, tr it's a tricky one. I think native is when it doesn't feel like you hit the brakes and stopped to deliver an ad. Right. Like if it feels like it's just in there, almost like the game shows yeah. to a degree. But sometimes, like I'm thinking like game shows in the 70s where it just all of a sudden like it just rolls it. Or how podcasters like Mark Marin or someone will do today <clears throat> where it's just like it feels like it's just part of the content. Right. And like they just sort of roll into the ad and roll out of it. And there's no like trickery or anything. It's like, oh, we're doing an ad right now but we tried to make it our way so that you didn't have to like go into a different environment. So it's and sort then of get it, sucked back into our environment. There's a certain amount of uh, continuity within, yeah. within the. You're still in the world I like that, that you were I like, in. You I didn't, like that. You didn't go out of a door right. into this world and come back in. Right, right. I guess. Yeah. So I guess one of the things that comes up a lot in, in branded content is budgets, obviously, comes up a lot in everything. So. Um, I guess Bethany would be a good one to talk to about this too. Um, how do you navigate a project requiring a high production look on a reduced budget? Uh, I know. This is like iPhones. Such, no, it's such a common theme, Kim. really. I think Nimble is kind of the new normal when it comes to producing, especially in branded content. Um, so I think it's really about finding production solves for, on my end. So finding a one-stop shop solution. So finding a location that will have a kitchen and then you could turn around and it'll have a bedroom. So you're, you're servicing multiple scripts in one location because you probably only have a day to shoot it with $12. Um, <laughs> your crew is also gonna be a lot more nimble. So your AC is gonna also probably be your DIT. Um, my AD is also producing it. So everyone's wearing a lot of hats. The location serves as multiple venues for each script, and I think that's how you ex execute it. You know, I also, which I'm sure you guys do, tap into my in-house resources. So, you know, making sure you have the right cameras to execute the vision of the creative yeah. and give it that high-value look. Dan, let me ask you about that since she's bringing up gear. Mm -hmm. How does gear uh, fit into this when you're on a tight budget? What what is for We've, run and gun? What do you like what actual gear? Well, well, the first thing gear or the, or the as far as procurement of gear, because we we're primarily everything in house, which I think is sort of different vice. Um, but what we do is, and we've always done this, 
is we use a big new project or a big budget opportunity to buy a bunch of equipment and then we milk it for years. <laughs> I mean, but that's like a thing. Like we did, um, a great example was a few years ago, we launched this thing with Intel. It was called the Creators Project. And we bought, I think, nine C300s with that budget, knowing that that was way more cameras than we were gonna need for that project, but knowing that we could then use those as shared internal equipment and we we still have them you know and this was maybe actually four years ago five years ago and you, we still have a ton of legacy equipment that we utilize hmm. so it's just kind of like this there's a big pool you know like but we use every opportunity we can to to purchase actually as like often as possible great so i'm going to change gears here a little bit um because this came up while i was sort of devising these questions was the recent event stemming from the Pepsi's in-house spot, um, what do you see as the role of traditional advertising in guiding and syncing up with brands' in-house content studios? You Wait, what was it? Can you explain this spot? Um, Sorry? I, Can you explain this spot? The, um, the yeah, it, um, it, it was, which, which I, I Jenner mean, was it? Oh, it was, oh, oh, yeah, yeah. the controversial, yeah. okay. Yeah, yes, the, yes, yes. Yeah, the okay. Jenner Lives Matter right. one, yeah. yeah. Right. That one, yeah. Okay. So, I was trying to be really delicate, but <laughs> I think <laughs> it I mean, didn't work so well. <laughs> I feel like they're focusing on this one in-house like production, but I f they probably ha if you look at like the rollout of in-house productions, there's been successful campaigns, I'm yeah, sure. sure. Um, but because this was such an epic fail, yeah. they're saying like kind of making this a universal message that we need to you know steer clear from that. That said. Having worked at an ad agency, I think utilizing that creative is important because it's a specialty skill. These people are utilized to, you know, create these campaigns. That's what they do. Right. So I think that the advertising agency will never die. It'll always have a big role in campaigns, and you need to tap into that creative. And and I I, I would I would tend to agree. And I think one of the things that came up in Ad Week in one of the conversations in Ad Week was use your ad agency to say no, to help you, right. because when you're in-house, people don't say no to the <laughs> boss very often, but an ad agency can say no to the boss. Right. And I think that was sort of the, the grand takeaway. What, what do you see as a takeaway from that particular thing? And, and, and it's, you know, look, Pepsi's done some great stuff. It's not about beating on Pepsi. It's more about what lessons are the takeaway here, because we're starting to see more and more brands go out and create high production value content without their agency. I don't know that it has, I mean, the agency's obviously gonna be the guy that get, gets hit, right, with this one to a certain extent, but ultimately, brands are gonna make mistakes, right? And I think that's the bigger, you, whether you have an agency there or you're doing it in-house or more and more people are going right, brands are going directly past the agency, right. directly to people, so <laughs> it's gonna happen. And I think the takeaway is that you, at, you need to own it yourself to a certain extent that you're a brand and, and own it. Like, and you're, you're going to make a mistake, but if you do make a mistake, you need to own it and move, you know, and then circle back and make adjustments. Mm -hmm. um, whether you're the agency that made the mistake or whether you're the brand that made the mistake, um, or you're, you're, you know, some other cog in the wheel, you mm -hmm. just have, you have to own it. So, do you have any? No. I, I... I'm an old school believer in all press being good press, and I think that ad worked. <laughs> so, I don't know. All right, now, now my head just exploded. Okay, <laughs> that's good, yeah. Because we're talking about Pepsi. Exactly. <laughs> um, yeah, so I, I, I guess that, yeah, it did kind of blow up um, because it was such an epic fail, as you say. And I think it does call into sort of the circle where. Do, should brands check with their check with their agency at least to make sure that there's some unanimity among um, the branded message? If we're heading off on a tangent, um, how, how I guess that that might be the, the follow-up question: that how important is continuity in branded messaging um, for a brand? In other words, is that still important or is it not important? Was I mean? I think, or, I think, are we are we are we? Is, no, I think you want to target a diverse group, so there's not one specific message that you want mm -hmm. to deliver, right? I mean, you're trying if you're trying to hit mass audiences, right. 
there isn't, you know, you're going to follow a specific path, but it's going to go off and veer off mm -hmm. in specific directions. Yeah, yeah. I, I think it depends on the product. Like, I think the reason Geico has so many different styles is because they have so many different products. Yeah. Right? And right. they have so many different markets that are all going to be affected. That's so the they, caveman. They, that they, yeah, Geico they want 16-year-olds the and they want 70-year-olds, right. you know? So it's like, for them, continuity right. I don't think is as important. But something like Crest or Chevy, you know, it's like... Right. They, like, for me, that seems like you want a consistent, con uh, consistent right. image. I think it really depends on what they're selling. Got it. Got it. Okay. okay. That, yeah. yeah. Yeah, that makes and and Geico was the other one I was thinking about where they where they have, they have absolutely so many different, different campaigns yeah, for yeah. for each and I mean they've even done stuff with us where they and and they you know they're interesting because they let their media like they have a, a, a they have their own brand but then they have things like where City Field makes their own Geico ads, Hot ninety seven makes their own Geico ads, Viceland makes their own ads for Geico. Is that right? right? Yeah. So like the people at, at City Field. They make the audio spots and the billboards, like the in-house creatives at City Field make those Geico ads. And they get paid to make those ads as a, a production company. Hot 97 has their own with like their DJs. So like that, you know, there's like that level of Yeah, I mean, we, we also have a, a Geico initiative with Coinage. And the reason why they liked it was because it goes across every single brand of ours. Right. So Coinage is basically personal finance, yep. but it'll be, they bought, they, they sponsored across people, time, fortune, money, S and CW. So a coinage story for people might be different than a coinage story for SI, but the Geico sponsorship goes across the whole thing. They, I mean, they want a huge, they, they want to hit everybody. Yeah. If Ge, I mean, if Geico could get all of us to convert to Geico, they would be very happy. Because, I mean, it, it, and it is interesting because it, it's such an interesting time right now because it used to be there was the, the brand steward. And whether that was the ad agency or the branding firm, they, they were the brand steward. And now, it sounds from what you're describing, brands are allowing other people to sort of hijack the brand to a certain degree. Um, yeah, I think under a certain level of approval. Right. It used to be very, very, yeah. very controlled. But I don't, I, I don't, I don't see that as hijacking for a company like Geico or like. General Mills or the larger ones. Well, I was talking about what you know, Dan was talking about, yeah. where where the delivery the delivery venue is sort of making decisions. Um, I think they still. I mean, they, it still goes yeah. through them before it goes right. out. But they're giving people the chance to maybe right. do it their own way to a degree. Right. But none of that stuff makes it up to the top tier, like primetime television right. spot. You right. know what I mean? Right. So it's it's never affecting like the major brand. Uh, singular message so i guess this can go out to whoever wants to take this one social media plays a big role in the distribution of content obviously how does the frequency of fresh content impact budgets and time frame from concept to completion it destroys budgets right it like ruins budgets i i think that it's like social content is so snackable and forgettable that it's not really about the production value you can execute something for a thousand dollars and then just throw it up online it'll live there for a day and then it goes off it's just really about the volume mm -hmm. to which you're producing it i don't necessarily think it is yeah. like you don't need the bells and whistles of a fancy production so concept to completion is fairly close yeah i mean if you're doing everything in house your overhead is so low right that you're just producing it and pumping it out are you guys doing that yeah we do that okay. yeah and then you forget it the next day yeah. Well, it depends on the type of content. Right. I mean, breaking news is garbage tomorrow. Right. right. But then other stuff, all of our food content, though, we will reuse that over and over and over again. Right. So our budgets for that will be different because, you know, it's it's a numbers game at that point, right? So if you make 600 videos, but you know that 60 of those 600 are going to be, right. you know, take off, and they don't have to be, they're not going to go viral. We don't, we're not searching for that. We're just searching for uh, a certain success metrics. Uh, and then also, then when you get a hit, you replay the crap out of it. So you, you it's like any show, right? Like if right. you get a hit show, you replay it, even on social. So, so what, is, what is the measure of success in social media? If it's not, if it's not viral, what is it? What, I mean, you, you mentioned a metric. I think I mean, it's what engagements, you, yeah. the views, okay. share, how many times people <laughs> are sharing it. And that, that's kind of the impressions. It's a hard one because certain, yeah. I mean, in certain cases, 
people are wanting guarantees, which is a new a new thing. So if you're going to go look for guarantees, then you have to have the volume in the buy to make it worth it, right? So I'm not. We're not going to sell you ten videos, right? Right? We're going to sell you a thousand because then we know we can guarantee it. You know, but I mean that also goes into guaranteeing the buying associated with it. You'll buy, you'll buy views on the other side of the aisle. What does that conversation look like where somebody asks for finite guarantees, which, hmm. which we've seen in, in traditional advertising over the years too? It's like you know, understanding that you're building awareness. There may not be a metric attached to that. Yeah. How do you? What's that conversation sound like? <laughs> I, 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 I had that. I've had that conversation with someone who will remain unnamed, uh, and. <laughs> Basically, we were explaining our demographic to them, what our metrics are, how many viewers we get per month, you know, what our range is, everything that we had. And they basically asked us, like, okay, that makes sense. You have the market we're looking for, blah, blah, blah. How do we know it's going to work? And we were just, we, we told them, we're like, I don't, are you asking us, like, to tell you if advertising works? Because... <laughs> like I don't know. You tell me. Like it's these are the numbers. I guess take a gamble. I can't. We can't show you the impact. It's impossible. You could wait a year and see how your sales change, but like who knows what it's going to be related to? It's like you know, there's a level of faith in advertising, right? In order to engage in it, you know, you can't. It was a crazy conversation. Yeah, and 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 I've had those conversations in yeah. my previous life. Um, the, the, but not from the agency side, from the creative side, the idea of defending a campaign against hard metrics. I think it's an education process, if I'm wrong. It, it, you're educating the customer that it may not be savvy about. There is not a hard metric. There are certain metrics you can look at, which is what you brought up. There's certain metrics you can look at, but it's not necessarily metrics directly related to a sale. Yeah. It's, made, it's, yeah. It's, 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 it's related to um, awareness. Like mm -hmm. somebody was aware of this, there was a certain amount of, of, of clicks, there was a certain amount, I mean that's... I also think that social like content doesn't, isn't necessarily tied to paid content, to paid media. So that's why it can right. be cheaper and doesn't have to be highly produced. You know, you're pumping it out so quickly because there's not necessarily paid money behind it. Right. I yeah, I mean, it's so it's changing on our side. It, so we've got. I mean, there's two models that are coming out, right? So the one is is literally full sponsorship, where we'll do. I mean, well done is a is an example. That is a social first brand. It's sponsored. You know, it just goes out like yeah. anything else that's paid. That, I mean, that, that's a real good point. There's yeah. a media buy. Right. Yeah. So there's not this huge ticket that right. the customer's looking at. Yeah. That mm -hmm. yeah, that takes a lot of. But pressure. I mean, Facebook's got mid roll coming out, so that's true. I mean, that's happening. So that's true. if mid roll's going on, then it's just programmatic. Like you're just going and right. They're they're going to be right. selling the ads. We're going to be selling the ads. Right. Um, so what? Yes. Question. You have to. I can't hear you. To talk to me. His question was about the lab. Dan. Mm -hmm. um, how does that conversation go? Watch me closely. Make sure I'm not going off on a tangent. How does that conversation go? Um, who pulls the plug? Is there a point where somebody says, "No, no, no, we're not going to do that"? Yeah. Or they just let you play. Um, Is that? It, it's a. Was that good? Right. How is the? <laughs> I feel like. I feel like I'm at the UN translating. Yeah, <laughs> put your headset on. Um, I think I can hear. <laughs> go ahead. Um, the conversation with the client. How does that go? Or do they even see anything until you're you're they, happy they with it? They see what they see what gets made, and so it, uh, it'll happen when a, a client comes to us and it's like we have a million different places for things to go, and we say this is Vice Land, this is the Vice Lab. Here's some exper like here's some experiments that have worked, that have gone to air, that people have liked, and if they want to go for it we engage the team and they have a certain amount of time and they make stuff on a very low budget and sometimes that stuff will work and the brand will say hey that one's good let's run it other times we'll make something and they'll say that's a great pitch now let's get you some better cameras and get you some better talent and do this again oh, cool and then they start maybe giving notes on it maybe somebody from their agency will come in and be a part of it 
and then other times they'll see it and say that's insane no <laughs> like one time we uh we kidnapped a car dealer a car dealer for fiat <laughs> and like took him out for like I mean you you kidnapped yeah. him. well we took him on a test drive and then wait 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 but you kidnapped him yeah well okay, we, right. we took him out to lunch <laughs> and then we went golfing and then like eventually got to the point where he's like this isn't a test drive anymore and then like he started to be like I'm going to get in trouble and we had to like go back and the guy at the car dealership was like you didn't ask to do, to do this and like we delivered that ad to Fiat and they were like no like that's just not going to fly this time <laughs> so that they said, have fun. That was, you know how these brands will come and say, just have fun with yeah, it. And we're like, all right, we're, like, Listen, we're gonna go have fun. We're gonna take this guy and we're gonna have a fun day in this Fiat. We went to a Forlini's in Chinatown, you know, and did the golfing at Chelsea Piers. It was fun. Yeah. And they said that what that, what that was illegal though. <laughs> slash fun. Yeah, <laughs> slash fun. <laughs> so that's how that worked out. So Bethany, do you have, do, does town, townhouse do anything like that or do they have like a lab that that plays a little bit or uh, is it more buttoned up no we do it's called um gosh, why is my mind sorry right, sorry right. um it is called pipe dreams pipe Studios. dreams pipe dreams <laughs> it's a it's a lab so to speak where everyone can go to play and use the equipment um and try to you know do creative there and then sell it to the client but it's not highly produced content it's just right. you know we're using it as a platform to try to sell stuff. Yeah. Basically, so creatives have a playground to play. And and how often does that? How often do those pieces end up the client loving it and having you shoot it at a high production value, higher production value? Um, does that happen? Yes. Twice. <laughs> there was more this than time. ten times. <laughs> there was that one time no. back in the day. Yeah, I mean, I wouldn't be a good person to speak mm. to that, but I know that it's it's tapped into frequently. So the, the creative department will make a presentation to the client saying, this is something we tried? Well, I think a lot of times, especially when we're pitching stuff and new clients, I think we're different entities a bit. When we're pitching new clients, mm -hmm. they'll use our resources, you know, non-paid to kind of try to sell that stuff. So our in-house, you know, crew, our in-house equipment is all dedicated to this pitch work for new clients. Got it. And then... So you, I'm going to follow up on that on another tangent. Was you mentioned in-house crew? So you're, do you hire freelancers to shoot? Yeah, or do you, okay. I would say more like you know when we're doing more of the run and gun docu style stuff. Depending on what the production value is and where it's going to live, we'll utilize our in-house people. Uh, if it's a little bit high, more highly produced, we'll get more of an A-list DP to come on board. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So that, that's kind of how it works. But we have a you know stable of producers. And then we kind of network out for, our, you know, a large majority of our crew. Got it. So um, this sort of segues into this. So, so many, for many people working in traditional filmmaking now, cinematographers, documentary filmmakers, etc., commercially branded content in its broadest sense is a new world. Can you describe, and I don't know whether each of you have this or this transition, or did you just launch into this? Please, if you did transition, can you can you talk about the transitional path and what advice you would give to those looking to make this transition from traditional filmmaking or documentary filmmaking into shooting brand content? Like, what would be a good way to start getting on the radar? Um, I mean, for or, me, I started in indie film, mm. and then I transitioned into advertising because there's no money in indie film. <laughs> And there's lots of money in advertising. <laughs> no, um, but I think it, it's about kind of, there's a certain learning curve that goes into like transitioning into any job. But I think the fundamentals are the same. Um, I think especially with branding content, what we're producing a lot of it is, it is nimble. So mm -hmm. it, so where a DP and a cin cinematographer on a set might have had, a, you know, an army of crew behind him, a second AC, a first AC, a DIT, he might need to learn how to be more nimble and check his ego at the door and understand that he's going to shoot it and afterwards he's going to dump the footage and transcode everything. So that's kind of like, that's one way to look at it. It's just really about learning the versatility of both worlds. Did you shoot, um, Did you when you got into your role originally, were you shooting? No, I was always producing. Oh, I have producing? I have shot when we come, you know, speaking of nimble, sometimes they tap you and like, guess what? You need to figure out how to shoot that because we need two shooters. And I'm like, okay. 
sure, why not? <laughs> but yeah, no, I my skill set lies in producing. Got it. So, do Chris or, or Dan, do you have any comments about people that are making, wanting to look at making this uh, maybe an, uh, an add-on to their career or maybe head in this direction for people that do documentary films? Yeah. Or, um, I, I would say find a newer brand or a legacy brand that's transitioning. So, time three years ago when we were getting in video, we were 30 people. Now we're 300. And so, there, Time does documentaries every single day, right? They had a lot of journalists that would partner with document like right. documentarians. And now it's like, oh, now we hire them all the time. So um, I think find the brands that are growing on that front. So um, in this case, anybody that's a legacy publisher, um, anyone that needs to transition into the digital side of video that isn't a television network, look for all of those guys because right. they need content or they're probably going to die. So. And, and do you think that... A, 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 a documentary filmmaker, um, to use that as an example, it would be more of a natural transition because of they're sort of a little bit less scripted. Yeah. It's telling a story, grassroots story kind of a thing. Is that yeah. is that a good it's is that a good fit for? It's certainly a good fit for journalism. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, they, they're, content, they're basically yeah. they're not the same exact thing, mm -hmm. but they're really really close. And and if if a company wants to do branded content mm -hmm. with a journalistic organization that's what they're looking for they're looking for documents right like they're not looking for I mean they do look for other things that aren't documentaries as well but a big chunk of that is going to be documentary style right I mean you guys right. all, everything you guys do is and that's yeah. encouraging so. for people who are doing doc films and yeah right, yeah I think the biggest variable is the politics ultimately. Yeah. Right. you know navigating the client yes uh, when you're doing documentary films it's like you're doing it for a passion right where you're working for a client you're servicing them it's not about what you want to Right, learning yeah. to work. Yeah. yeah, I think that's a good point. Like, it's almost like you're not going to do it as an independent person. If you want to do branded content, go do it with a company, yeah. and then if you want, and then do your independent work as well. I don't see a lot of brands reaching out to independent people to do things because you need a lot of people. At, I mean, half of the people as we've grown, half of the people are like client relations and engagement people. You need a whole team to get the content out so mm -hmm. like I, I i don't see there being like a lot of one man band or one person band branded content houses i think it's like yeah if you want to do branded content go work for like right. one of us yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah be a captive for example yeah for example, or like yeah. something like that right did you say something no it was just just the voices talking That's right. i was nodding and smiling yes yes, <laughs> yes. I agree. Dan, question. Okay. Um, what technical advances um, have made life easier and deliverables more effective? Can you think of anything that's... We switched... From, besides uh, digital cameras. We switched cameras. to Adobe Premiere. That was good. <laughs> <laughs> um, the new Premiere? The what's new that? The new version? Well, just we were Final Cut for a long time. No, I don't know. I mean, everything's gotten easier. <laughs> it's like we used to have tapes, you know? Right. Uh, it's just been good and also the like Facebook Live and stuff like that is really great because live is an awesome opportunity for branded content because mm -hmm. A, you get rid of all the committee stuff. Once they approve the idea and you go live, you have your two hour thing and we're doing stuff with Twitch now, which is also really exciting. And I think the live streaming stuff, the, even though the quality is still low by most people's standards, like the bit rate and right, right. You know, the look. I think that's like one of the most exciting advancements is the ability to go straight from a phone over your Wi-Fi and be doing live branded crazy. content. I mean, crazy. that's that couldn't have happened. It's crazy. See, if you told someone 20 years ago that was right. happening, they'd be like, yeah, okay. Yeah, whatever. Flying cars. Yeah. 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 But so that's really great. And I think I'm also looking forward to seeing more ways to get good cameras into Facebook Live. By good cameras. Like yeah, cinema cameras. Yeah, not film. Because that's that's the biggest issue right now is making it look good. Yeah. Right. But you know the pipe the pipe is there. Right. So we just got to get the right cables. Right. Right. <laughs> yeah. Which is why we're all here. <laughs> Anybody else? This was a specific Dan question because he works in the gear. Anybody else yeah. advances that don't have to be gear related? Well, I think for gear related, actually, Abel and I worked together this year. Yay. We just got the Red Epic <laughs> W. Um, thanks, guys. Uh, I think dual f the cameras that shoot dual format really has helped on the back end. So, you know, we have a proxy edit format that helps, you know, 
we we actually edit on the Avid, so we're we're losing the transcoding process because it, no. you know, it'll give us a DNX file, whereas before we had to spend all that time transcoding the footage. Uh, we also get the you know native the raw file that we can send right to color correct and conform, which is great for us because it saves a lot of time and you know when you're trying to pump things out quickly, it really helps on the back end. So, yay for Good those answer. cameras. Good answer. <laughs> Thanks, Abel. I didn't make her say that to you. <laughs> <laughs> Chris, anything? I don't, sorry, I, I don't, unless AR is the big one for us. That's going to be. Is that right? That's going to, yes. Dan? That's gonna be, I'll let you guys have that one. Yeah. Dan was shaking well, his head. So, the fun part for us is we can integrate with, we can have larger campaigns. Now. So, you can have. Uh, you can have something in, in our actual magazines and mm -hmm. then have activations go with videos. So you can have, which is really cool. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that's something where that advance is helping us sell. Because it's not just about the video that you're selling, whether it's native or pre-roll or whatnot. Mm -hmm. You're then selling the experience associated with all the platforms, which if you want people, in our case, to subscribe, whether it's not just to old print style, but whether it's SVOD or something like that, you can then get them to really engage. Um, and it takes it to the next step for us, which is really, really nice. Interesting. I guess that's interesting. That's like a way of making the magazine come alive. Oh yeah, they've done. So we did one for um, for Star Wars, and we did one for Pirates of the Caribbean, which was really, really? cool. So yeah, so inside the life. So this is the weird thing. So inside the Life VR app, you can go and go take a picture of the cover, and it'll animate. Or you, the, the Star Wars one, you can play the, play a game with it. Um, but it also got you to go check out all the Life VR content. Uh, and this is live now. Yeah, it's launched. Oh wow! Yeah, but it's also once you've invested the time into the technology on the back end, even though like okay, so Star Wars came out, no one cares about it now, right? But guess what? You have another one coming out next month, and another one coming out the month after, and it, it creates something that if you invest in the technology at the front end and the coding level, then it's easy to replicate that. You right. just uh, the then it's really about the ideation around how you're going to have things be dynamic. Hmm. So it's pretty fun. Interesting. It's a really interesting use for that. Bethany, is there anything happening in the agency world around VR that much or <coughs> AR? Um, I mean, a little bit. There's a lot of talking about it. I guess my fear with VR and 360 is it's going to be like 3D. You know, like what was it like four or five years ago? Everyone was like, 3D is the new. This is it. And now it's like, no, VR and 360. That's it. So, I mean, mm. there's talk of it, but you know, I think ultimately we're always going to rely on traditional ways of shooting. Right, things. as the baseline. Yeah. Right. Oh yeah. So have there been clients actually asking? Yeah, oh yeah, it, definitely. Right? And what do you say? What, 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 not what you say, but what does what the agency typically yeah, say? Yeah, I mean, you, you want to explore everything. I think right. it gives consumers a more more engagement and a different way to engage with the with have, the have you produced anything in VR? We've yet? been asked to. We, right. we don't have that skill set yet. We're, mm -hmm. That's why I'm here, to learn about VR mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and 360. But no, I haven't actually participated in that just yet. Yeah, it's slightly different. So. Let me ask you about. Let's get more into the more into the creative end of things and getting your opinions on what if if you could think of one thing you've seen recently that inspired you in whether branded content or somebody using it in a unique way. Um, was there something that you've seen recently that there's somebody crushing it right now? I have an answer. Vices? Yeah. <laughs> no. Yeah, no vices. Uh, <laughs> Baskets, the TV show on yep. FX. I'm not sure. I would like someone to tell me, but I'm pretty sure that, that Arb Galifianakis? Zach Galifianakis yep. and Louis Anderson, no. they talk about Arby's multiple times in every episode right. and the curly fries. <laughs> and I, I have to believe that's on purpose. Oh, interesting. Yeah, product placement. But, it, yeah. but they turned it into comedy because... Right. Louis Anderson plays a certain character that's constantly talking about curly fries, and it's hilarious. And it's in the story. And it's in this. It's part of the story, yeah, right. and it, if that's branded content, but good product placement, that's great because Louis Anderson. Without hilarious. actually seeing it, right? He's just yeah, saying. Yeah, he just talks about it <laughs> a lot, and I think it's very funny. I think it should be funny. I feel like branded content is its best when it's funny. Like right. when you can laugh at the brand, you can laugh at the show, and you can the whole thing's just a joke. I think like that's for me the best. Sweet Unless spot. I'm really learning something, right. but if it's funny, then I'm like, all right, cool. Everyone's in on the joke. This, this, they need money to make something. We're gonna do ridiculous product placement. 
and it's going to be obviously ridiculous. I, I, that's right. my favorite. Cool. That's great. Any of you guys, besides the Pepsi ad, anything that's really been... <laughs> Uh, that I you've seen recently in or... In terms of specific ad, I mean, I think in terms of flat platform, I think BuzzFeed's doing a great job. BuzzFeed? Yeah, I think that they're, you know, they're not only tapping into, it's it's beyond people just visiting their site. They understand that you have to share every, the content. It's it's not just gifts, it's everything that they're right. producing. And they're, they do topical, they do humor, they do cats. So, <laughs> yeah. I, I think okay. they're doing a great job of really, the, you know promoting social content Great. and branded content. Yeah, I agree, Chris. Yeah, I, I, I like Courageous, which is CNN's, Brandon. Mm -hmm. That's right, you mean, so, yeah. Yeah, I, I just like, Courageous. I can't it's think cool. of a particular one off right, the top no, of my head, but, but it's I pretty think cool content. they have a studio like like all of us have, have them the right. same way, and uh, right. they just do a really good job of understanding who, who their brand is and moving it forward, so. And they've got a great, huge platform, so they get, you know. That's true, the which, delivery platform. Which, which yeah, they, yeah, it really does help. Okay, this is going to... Oh, go ahead. What, yeah. We should talk about this. Red Bull. Yeah. Like... Yeah. <laughs> they're con they're, they're, they're inspirational oh, yeah. in a sense because they created their, like, brand, their concept, but then they've created, like, new sports and, like, uh, may have yeah. made things happen in the world. Yeah. Do we consider them branded content? Or yeah. are they... Because, I mean, they are their own... What yeah. is that? I think... It, the branded content it like kind of extends the activation and engaging right. your right. consumers. So I think that's it. Yeah. yeah it's hard it's to classify them. <laughs> no one's standing there holding yeah. the Red Bull. It's the idea of Red Bull being hyper <laughs> right. and doing these really hyperactive <laughs> events and it's an ecosystem kind of, though. Yeah. The whole thing. Yeah, caffeinated e ecosystem. Yeah. 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 But the is. crazy thing is I like the content more than the product, you know? Like, I think a lot of people do. <laughs> people would rather watch, like, a lot of Red Bull content than drink it. That's funny. Right? They should have you in a focus group. I don't think so. <laughs> All right, so we're going to have to wrap it up. I have one last question real quick, and you can answer it or not answer it. Who, what inspires you? Outside of branded content? Outside, outside of branded content. That's a, we decided it was a drinking game. Every time we say branded, we had it. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Didn't work out so well. I don't know. Pass no. device. What is that? Pass who inspires? <laughs> What's the question? I'm just, who inspires you? Is there is there a person that you follow? Uh, uh, somebody who's a, a creative that you follow? A uh, comedian that you follow? Uh, I don't know. That's okay. too hard. All right, that's yeah. a gotcha question. Okay. Yeah, this is, I know. Skateboarding. All right. Cool. So I want to thank um, our panel, Bethany, Chris. Oh, one more. was there a question? No. No? That was your question. Who inspires you? Right. <laughs> All right. Bethany, Chris, and Dan, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, guys. Right. You can leave. <laughs>